Hi everybody, my name is Pastor Dave Myers. I'm the lead pastor here at Royal Oak Victory Church. And thanks for joining in on the message today. My prayer is that it'll strengthen your faith, encourage your heart, and speak something powerful into your life. If it turns out to be a blessing, would you please consider sharing it with someone else as one of our passions here at ROVC is to get the word out to as many people as possible. And so without further ado, let's jump right into today's message. We're beginning a brand new series this morning and I'm going to be diving into it, but I want to just read something to see if you can figure out what it is. Um, we go to school so we can become more equipped to earn it. Uh, and then we spend the rest of our lives up to 40, 60 hours a week desperately trying to make it. We invest countless of hours thinking and talking about how we will handle it. And we walk around department stores and shopping malls figuring out just how we're going to spend it. More often than not, we care to admit, we get caught up worrying and stressing over whether we'll have enough of it. And we spend a lot of time dreaming and scheming of ways how we can get even more of it. Arguments over it are one of the leading causes of marital disintegration, business breakups, and all-out government shutdowns. And despair of losing it has led many to depression, mental breakdowns, and even suicide. Some have called it the root of all evil, others have deemed it a means for great good, but one thing I think all of us can agree upon is we simply can't ignore the incredible importance it has in our lives. And so how many figured out what it is? What is it? Money. Yeah, some of you were pretty quiet there. Money, yeah, so regardless of how you might look at it, money does matter, it matters, it really does, it matters in our lives, but you know, uh, it also matters to God. And this morning we're beginning a brand new uh, series we've entitled Dollars and Cents, uh, a biblical view of earning, saving, spending, and giving. And we're going to be in this series for a little while, you know, it's going to be a lot of fun, we're actually, one Sunday we're going to be doing a panel with some financial folks, and you'll text in your messages, and I'm looking forward, not messages, your questions, that's right, and I'm looking forward to that, but uh, you know, some, some people, they might be thinking, in fact, you might be here thinking this very thing, saying, Pastor, why on earth would we be talking about money in church? Um, I mean, I thought church was a place where you learn about prayer and you learn about uh, heaven and sanctification and worship and things like that. I mean, why on earth would we be talking about something so carnal as money in church? Well, it's a great question, um, but it may surprise you that the Bible has a whole lot to say when it comes to the whole area of money, wealth, and possessions. It really does. In fact, there are 10 times, now think about it, 10 times as many verses in the Bible referring to money and finances than faith, prayer, and salvation combined. How many know God has a lot to say about money? Jesus said more about money than both heaven and hell put together. In fact, out of the 38 parables that Jesus told, 16 of those parables have to do with money and stewardship and the good practice of those. So God has a lot to say when it comes to our money. Now, I know as soon as I say that, some of you are thinking, well, um, why is God so interested in money, especially my money? Like, doesn't he have enough of his own? Uh, I thought the streets of heaven were paved with gold, and have you looked at the price of gold nowadays? And I thought the, the gates of heaven were made out of solid pearls. I mean, why would God be so interested in my meager nest egg, my money? Uh, well, that's a great question. And the answer to it is not because heaven is in recession. How many are thankful for that? We might have a little bit of it down here on earth, but it's not there in heaven. Um, heaven is not in recession. God does not need your money to keep the angels employed. 
Uh, but rather he knows that if he has your money, then he has something far more precious, something he's far more interested in, and that is none other than your heart and your lives. If he has your money, he has your heart. And so um, if you're taking notes uh, this morning, which I would encourage you to do, I uh, you might want to write this fact down. What I earn and what I own can't be separated from who I am. Uh, what I earn and what I owe cannot be separated from who I am. Um, in other words, um, our money, our wealth, our possession cannot be unraveled um, from who we are. They are virtually inseparable. Uh, they really are. And, you know, it was a few years ago I heard the story of two Iranian twins, Siamese twins, who had been born together, joined at the head. It's quite a story. They lived that way together for 28 years until finally they made a decision. Uh, they said, despite the risk, we want to separate. And so... Um, they did that. They made the decision. 28 doctors with a team of 100 assistants began a very complex operation that lasted for over 50 hours. And although it seemed to be going well at first, the surgery seemed to be successful. In the end, both twins died. Yeah, it's a, you can look it up. It's a tragic story. The doctors said that they simply shared too many key parts of their brain. And, you know, when I heard that story, the thought that came to me is, in many ways, that's exactly what it's like with our money and our lives. The two are inseparably joined together, and because of it, separation is virtually impossible. It really is our money, and our lives. And, you know, that's exactly what Jesus said in many of his teachings. And as I said, Jesus taught a lot about money. Uh, one of the places where he spoke about money, and we're going to turn that, if you have your Bibles, uh, either turn them on or turn them to, Matthew 6, verse 19. Uh, we're going to look at some verses there. Um, but this is what Jesus says in Matthew 6, 19. He says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. And then in verse 20, he says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Um, and, you know, there's a whole lot of stuff being said in these verses. Some of it we'll be uh, covering as we move on in this series. But the, the, the fact that uh, the principle I want to zero in on this morning is the one I just mentioned. Um, the intimate connection between our money and our heart. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there is your heart. One translation says, for your heart will always be where your riches are. Always. In other words, there's a very clear connection between our treasure and our heart, our possessions, and our passions, our assets and our affections, our wealth and our devotions. And that's why, that's why, that's why our money matters so much to God, because he knows that one of the best ways to determine whether he has all of us all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength. One of the ways God determines whether he really has all of us is not how loud we sing on Sunday in church, but rather what we do with our money. It's kind of quiet in here now, isn't it? Um, either say amen or oh me. It has to do with our money because what we earn and what we own can't be separated from who we are. And so this morning what I'd like to do is look at this intimate connection between heart and possession, uh, money and devotion. And, um, and I've called it money talks. How many have ever heard that phrase, money talks? Um, very common phrase. You know, one person said money talks. The only problem is that it never hangs around long enough to have a decent conversation. 
Um, someone else said money talks. It just has to stop a lot more often to catch its breath. Uh, money talks, it's just that its list of speaking engagements are growing far fewer. And then I like this one, uh, money doesn't talk at all, it just makes a sonic boom as it flies its way by. <laughs> and um, money talks, it speaks volumes about who we really are. Uh, volumes about what we're really like. And this morning, what I'd like to do is look at some of the things money says about us. I call it the tale my money tells. The tale my money tells. What your money is really saying about you. The tale my money tells. And you know, one of the first tales it tells is my money is the revealer of where my affections really lie. And as I said, it's pretty easy for us to say things like, I'm a Christian, I love Jesus, you know, he means absolutely everything to me. It's fairly easy to say things like that, but one of the greatest revealers of exactly where our devotion and affections lie is found in what we do with our money. And so that means if you want to find out what a person really loves, is really passionate about, uh, just uh, look at their bank account. Look at what they spend their money on. Because that'll tell you a lot. Now, I think a lot of us have heard that saying, the win eyes are the window to the soul. How many of you have heard that before? And I think part of that is true. I really think that the window to the soul is far lower than that. In my wallet or in my purse is the window to the soul. Um, because that says a lot about the condition of our soul. Uh, our money says a lot about what our soul is in love with, uh, some of the things that our soul is passionate about. And so I challenge you, even this week, um, to take some time and look at what you're in the habit of spending your money on. Um, if there are a lot of things like entertainment and eating out and skipping the dishes... Uh, clothes and shoes, how many uh, husbands can say amen to that? Um, clothes and shoes and, 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 and vacations and, and cars and computers and home electronics and furnishings. If there's a whole whack of things that are listed in that category, but very few things like giving to the church and helping the poor and oversee missions and supporting God-directed enterprise, if there's very few of those things, uh, then you really should sit up and take notice because it's possible, it's possible that with your mouth you're saying things like, I love Jesus. With your mouth, it's possible that you're saying, I'll follow you, Lord, wherever you lead me. It's possible that you might believe that God comes first in your life, but maybe, just maybe, your finances are telling a different story. Because the fact is, is we can't truly say we love God and are fully committed and devoted to Him without expressing it with how we handle our finances and our possessions. We can't. And the Bible is clear about that. You know, the writer of Proverbs says, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. One translation says, glorify God with all your wealth. Another one says, worship God with your wealth, honoring him with your very best. In other words, one of the ways we love God, one of the ways we express our love and devotion to him is not just by singing, and it's not just by lifting our hands. It's not just by praying, and it's not just by seeking him. As wonderful as all those things are, but one of the main ways we express our affection and love towards our God is by what we do with our money. That we literally honor him, worship him with our possessions and our wealth, giving him the best of what we have. And so that's the first tale my money tells. It's a revealer of where the seat of my devotion is. You know, the other tale my money tells is money is an indicator of the quality of character I possess. 
And I've heard it said that if you really want to know what a person is like, then open up their books, their financial life, and take a look at what they do with money. Because it's in that arena, the money arena, that uh, says a whole lot about the people we are, the person we are. Our money tells us tales of what we value the most in life. Our money tells us tales of how disciplined and self-controlled we are. When we get that letter in the mail that says you can up your credit card five more thousand. It's getting quiet in here. No money down, no interest, no payments in 2026. And we buy it just like that not realizing that at that moment on 2026, now maybe you think Jesus will come and take us home by then. (laughs) That would be good financial planning. But on 2026, when those interest rates come, they will come, they make a, a mafia loan shark embarrassed. They're crushing. And so money tells us how self-controlled we are. Uh, Money tells us the story of how integral and trustworthy we are. In fact, someone said it like this, that a person's character is put to a grave test whenever they suddenly acquire or lose a large amount of money. Your character is tested at those times. And, you know, I never bought one, but a lot of people buy lotto tickets, right? They want to win it big, win it big. I want to win it big. And so, you know, whether it's $5 million or $15 million or $50 million, wouldn't it be awesome to win $50 million? I know some of you are dreaming right now. And yet, if you look at the story of those who won really, really big, uh, a lot of them, um, two years, three years later, their lives are in misery. They don't know who to trust. They used to have 15 friends. Now they have 155,000 friends. And in-laws and outlaws they never even knew before come out of the woodwork. They don't know who to trust. Their lives begin to crumble apart. Why? They don't have the character to handle that amount of wealth. And so if you really want a character test, see what you're like when you lose or acquire a large sum of money. Now, I know some of you are saying, Lord, put me to the test. <laughs> And he may. Phone me, contact me, we'll do it together. I'll be your coach. But anyway, sorry. You know, recently I heard the statement made by a pastor in the persecuted church in China, a church under great persecution. His comments were very interesting. He, his observation is this. 95% of Christians who face the test of persecution pass it successfully Well, 95% of those who face the test of prosperity fail it miserably. It's called the suffering of affluence, okay? I want you to think about that. There's different kinds of suffering in the world. There's, There's suffering of going without, not having enough food on the table, not having money to put clothes on your back. There's that kind of suffering. There's suffering of persecution that goes on in many countries around the world as Christians and churches come under heavy persecution. But, you know, one of the greatest kinds of suffering that Christians face today is the suffering of affluence. Because we enter into a culture that is full and running over with abundance and prosperity, and yet we don't have the character to handle it. We just can't handle it. What it reveals is the corrupting power money can have on our lives um, if we let it. And you see this over and over again in the scriptures, that God himself, speaking of his own people, said an interesting thing in Hosea 13, verse 6. He says, when I, this is God speaking, fed them, they were satisfied. When they were satisfied, they became proud, and then they forgot me. And what we see here is a sad progression. I would rather call it a digression that when God's people were fed, 
From being fed, they became satisfied, and from being satisfied, uh, they became proud. And once pride set in, they all of a sudden developed an acute sense of spiritual amnesia. They forgot God, the very God who blessed them, the very God who gave them all the nice stuff they forgot God. And you know, when I read this verse, I can't help but think that it is a very, very tragic but very accurate commentary of our world today, especially in North America, that the richer and more prosperous we have become, the more we have forgotten and forsaken the very God who enabled us to get that way in the first place. We forgot about him. We've forgotten about him in our schools. We forgot about him in our homes, our families. We forgot about him in our places of work. We forgot about him in our halls of higher education, our government, our judicial system. In fact, in some cases, we even forget about him in church. And what it speaks of is the contaminating, corrupting nature money, possession, and wealth can have on our lives when those who receive it don't have the quality of character to handle it. And so I want you to think about that in your own life. Maybe rather than praying for God to bless you more, maybe a better prayer is God build me more. Build me more. Make me more honest. Make me more in love with you. Make me more passionate for you. Give me a greater heart for you and your kingdom and what you desire to do. Lord, may you give me a fresh revelation of of just how wonderful and glorious you are because when I see you for who you really are, then I give you my heart. When I give you my heart, then you can entrust me with greater blessings. Amen? Amen. You know, Moses said in Deuteronomy 8, 18, remember that it is the Lord your God who gives you the power to become rich. He does this because he is still faithful today to the covenant that he made with your ancestors. Nevertheless, don't forget the Lord your God or turn to other gods to worship and serve them. And so right here we see what God's will is for our lives. Think about it. His will for our lives is to bless us and prosper us. That's his will. Not only is it his will, he gives us the ability to do it. He says, look, I'm going to give you power. Power. I'm going to give you wisdom. I'm going to place my favor and blessing upon you so that you can prosper and receive all the good things that I have for you. But in saying that, he gives a grave warning, and he says, look, when that happens, when, when, when I begin to pour out my blessing upon you, don't do what my people did in the Old Testament. Don't turn your back on me. Don't let the prosperity corrupt you. Don't let it turn your heart away from me to all the other fun and other things that are going on around you. Don't serve or worship other things. Keep your heart pure to me. And so our money tells the tale of where our devotions are really at. Money tells the tale of the quality of character we possess. And then lastly, this morning, my money is what qualifies me to receive God's greater riches. And you know, as wonderful as it is to have nice stuff, I mean, I like nice stuff. I like driving a nice car. I like living in a nice home. I like having exotic vacations where they actually, it's warm. They have a sun there. (laughs) Living here in Canada, you kind of wonder, like, is there, I think there's an eclipse of the sun coming, but we never see anything. It's just snow and more snow and snow and more snow. And then, and then a little touch of spring and snow and more snow. And, you know, I love getting on an airplane and going somewhere where there ain't no such thing as snow. <laughs> Amen? And you can tickle your toes in the ocean and walk on the sand. Anyway, I'm just getting caught up with it right now. I love those things. I love exotic vacations. I love all the latest toys and gadgets. But you know what? As wonderful as all that is, and it is wonderful, there are still things that are greater in value than those. 
Jesus called them the greater riches, and you see them here in Luke 16, 10. Therefore, if you've not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? I like how the Living Bible puts this verse. It says, if you are untrustworthy with worldly wealth, that's money. That's cold, hard cash. Then who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? In other words, what Jesus is saying here is that what we do with our money, our wealth, our possession is one of the determining factors to see whether we are fit enough, qualified to take part in what he calls greater riches. Now, you might be here saying, well, pastor, what could possibly be more valuable than all the nice stuff, the cars, the houses, whatever? What could be more valuable than that? Well, there's a whole lot of things more precious than those. Jesus called them true riches, and true riches are things like things that money can't buy you, things like peace in your mind. How many of you know there's a lot of very wealthy people who don't have peace in their mind? Peace in your mind and and joy in your heart and love in your home. I mean, the Beatles used to sing it. Money can't buy you love, right? I'd sing it, but then we'd empty the building. But it can't, it just, it can't do it. Uh, Love in your home and, 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 and health in our families and marriages, contentment and true satisfaction. The Rolling Stones sang about that one. I can't get no boom, boom, boom. Can't, he's still singing it. How old is Mick Jagger now? Must be 103 years old. How old? 86, and he's still singing, I can't get no satisfaction. (laughs) Well, of course not. You need Jesus in your hearts and mind. Amen. And so there's a lot of greater riches than money and wealth. Things like an increased measure of God's favor, his authority, his anointing on your life. And Jesus makes it clear. He says that our ability to receive those and walk in them is directly related to what we do with our money. And if we can't be faithful there, if we can't be proven faithful there with our money, then we can't be faithful with the greater things. God has greater things he wants to give us. But if we're not faithful with the smaller things, we won't get the bigger things. You know, the way I look at it is, let's say I gave my son, when he was younger, I gave my son the keys to my ride on lawnmower. Now, just to let you know, I don't have a ride on lawnmower because uh, my yard isn't big enough to handle one of those. But let's say I did. Let's say I had one and I gave him the keys to my ride on lawnmower. He went in, fired it up, went around the yard a couple times, smashed it into the fence and, um, and, 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 and broke it. How many of you know if he did that, there's no way. There's no way I'm going to give him keys to my Lexus SUV. <laughs> and just to let you know, I don't have one of those either. So. <laughs> It's the same thing with God. He says that if you can't be faithful to handle the lesser stuff of money, of wealth, of possessions, then how will he ever entrust you with his greater riches? And, you know, I thought about these greater riches. and You know, just kind of dreaming, just kind of creatively thinking. What it could mean is that right now, There might be less apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers on earth because the people, some of the people who are to receive that office have not proven faithful with their money. Now, that's a wild thought. Uh, There could be less gifted educators or artists or writers or leaders or business people simply because those who were destined to receive all those things couldn't because of the way they use their money. 
Right now, there might be uh, greater anointings and blessings, outpourings of God's spirit that he wants to pour out upon his church. He's just itching to pour out upon his church in these last days, just itching to release it from heaven, but they're not coming through. They're stuck up in the heavenlies. Why? Because maybe we as his people have not been faithful with the unrighteous mammon. It's a pretty heavy thought. Of course, the opposite is true as well, and that is that as we are obedient and generous and and faithful to use money and possessions uh, as God directs us, as he has given us, just think of what God can do in our lives. Amen? And I think that God is on the verge of blessing some of you. I felt this in the earlier service. I feel like you've been faithful. You've been giving. You've been generous. You have sacrificed. You've been following God passionately in the whole area of finances and possession. And I believe that you are on the verge of an open window, a greater door of opportunity. I believe God wants to flood his fresh favor upon you and lift you higher than you've ever been before. I believe that. I believe that some of you are this close and that this is the year because you have sown much, you've prayed much, you've given much. This is the year. And you know, Clarice and I have seen that uh, this principle happen over and over in our lives. You know, many of you know when we first got married, we packed our things up and went out to the Maritimes and planted a church. And we didn't have uh, any denomination. We didn't have any support. All we had was the commitment of six families who wanted to do it. All I can say is they were lean years, those first few years, lean years. Matter of fact, um, I remember the first year we were there, I've never been good at doing books or income tax, and so I asked a gentleman in my church if he could do it for us, uh, fill out our income tax for the year, and we went in to see him, and we walked into his office. He looked so depressed. I thought, man, what's happening? I hope I don't owe uh, the government a whole bunch of money or something. And I said, what's up? What's wrong? And he said, you know, I've been looking at your financials, And he says, I don't even know how you guys get by month by month. That's what he said. That was the first few years. It was lean. I mean, we 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 shopped at at the secondhand store. What did they call that store there? In Frenchies in the Maritimes. Anybody here been to Frenchies? Yeah. (laughs) Buy all this awesome used stuff. Didn't fit quite right. But, you know, we just kept faithful. We just kept giving, tithing, faithful to what God has done. And over the years, the momentum builds up. Amen? God's blessing increases both here on earth and over our lives. And uh, since then, we've been blessed. I mean, Clarice, you know, the hardest time of year for us is Christmas and at our birthdays. Because Clarice will say, what do you want for Christmas? I'll say, I don't know. I don't know. And I really think about it. What do I want? What do you want for your birthday? I don't know. I mean, I got everything I need. I mean, God has blessed us so much. I mean, we have no debt. We paid our house off years ago. We paid, we, yeah. I don't buy anything on credit. And I'm going to be talking about that next week. Um, that's freedom. Amen. It's one of our, it's one of our uh, core values. Living simply, simply, living simply so you can give generously. And I'll tell you, God is faithful. If you follow him, he will do amazing things in your life in this whole area of finances. Amen. And so those are some of the tales my money tells. Our devotion, our character, And whether we are ready for the greater riches that he wants to pour out in these end times. But you know, I want to close by proposing a question to you. And it's this. If my money should suddenly speak, just what things would it say about me? If it were to speak, if it were to 
grow a tongue. Just what things would my money say about me? You know, we're going to partake of communion in a little bit. Uh, but before we do, um, I want you to put your attention on the screen. It's all about a number. It always has been, even before I knew that it was. In high school, I amassed honors and extracurriculars. At Penn, I grabbed every internship, pledged the right fraternity, and got involved with the clubs I needed to to distinguish myself from all the other Ivy League 4.0s. After doing 80 to 100 hour weeks on Wall Street as an analyst, I finally realized what I was chasing, a number what my net worth had to be to give it all up. I met my wife while I was at Chicago banging out my MBA. Grad school was a cakewalk compared to the street. I played hard and we fell in love and made plans for our future. We would have three kids, a house in the suburbs, a summer place. I pushed myself harder than ever. At first, my wife was resentful of my long hours and my distracted attention, but then the kids came and she was just as distracted and exhausted as I was. And the kids? I coached soccer on Saturday mornings, showing up for all the lacrosse games and ballet recitals, but really, every time I looked at them, all I could think about was that number. If I could get there, we would be able to really enjoy each other someday. I'd sacrifice when they were little so that they could have this amazing life and then they'd look back and see that all I was doing was out of love for them. But the grind, it never ends. When I made VP, I was still on the 6 a.m. train surrounded by all the other blue suits, only now I was out with clients most nights, expected to help land the big ones and keep them happy. I was made a managing director at a rival firm. I was a rock star, moving heaven and earth because now I could see the light at the end. Once I made partner, I knew, I knew that number was mine. Sure, I still had crushing responsibilities, a huge staff spread over three continents, shareholders' unrealistic expectations, hotel rooms 10 days a month, but I was now sure I would finally catch that number, that thing I had been giving up my life for that number would finally let me have long vacations with my wife and get to know my kids on a real level, surrounded by my family's love and respect. I mean, who doesn't want that? To feel that their whole life had been validated. Now here I am, the final lap. I'll retire at the end of the year. I'm still young enough to really enjoy it, too. One of the lucky ones to get out in time to really live. Jesus said, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever desires to lose his life for my sake and the gospel will find it. For what will it profit a man? It begains the whole world and loses his own soul. Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And I think that we've been giving too much of ourselves away to things that in the end are just going to destroy us. If we were to be honest with ourselves, in some ways they have become idols in our hearts. Some of their corruption has seeped in and it's blinded us and distracted us to pure affection and passion 
for the Lord. And I really feel the heart of God today wooing us, telling us that I'm the one whom you're looking for. I'm over here. I'm the one who will satisfy the emptiness in your own soul, in your own heart. I'm the one. And if you would only seek me and invite me and embrace me into your life, you'll begin to drink deeply of those true riches that Jesus spoke about. And so I want us all to stand. Um, We're going to partake of communion. But I really feel, and I prayed this in our staff prayer this morning, I really feel that God wants to do some surgery in our hearts today. He wants to separate us from all the false loves, the love of the world and the love of other things so that he can fill us with his love. But you know, before we get our elements ready, I want us to bow our heads and close our eyes just for a moment. But maybe you're here this morning and you'd say, you know, Dave, as we were talking, as you were talking, as I was listening, I'm at a place where I need to give my heart fully to Jesus. I've never done it before. I've never really opened my life up to him and I feel him knocking because the Bible says he does that. He comes, knocks on the door of our heart. And he says, if you'll open the door, I'll come in. We'll have supper. I'll sup with you. I'll have relationship with you. And with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, how many here would say, you know, pastor, pray for me. I want to receive Christ as my Lord and Savior. Just lift your hand. Just lift your hand. Lift it high. Don't be shy. Lift it up. Thank you for that hand. Anybody, that hand. Anybody else? Just lift it high. It's between you and the Lord. Lift it high. Thank you for that hand. Father, you see these hands in this place today. Father, And what I want you to do, if you've lifted your hand, if you've opened, just to open your heart to him, ask him to come and forgive you and cleanse you and wash you. Confess him as your Lord and Savior. Ask for his forgiveness for chasing every other thing but him. Father, we do that right now. And we thank you that you are faithful, that when we call upon your name, you will answer, you will show, you will come. We pray it all in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Well, let's give the Lord a clap offering. Let's thank, yeah, let's thank the Lord for that. Amen. Hey, everybody. Thanks for watching the message today. And I hope that it lifted and encouraged you in some way. If you made a decision to follow Christ today, we would love to know about it. And the best way to do that, to let us know, is by heading over to our website at rovc.ca and clicking on the tab that says connect with us. Also, if this message was a blessing to you, we'd love it if you could get the word out by liking and subscribing or even giving to our ministry. If you're interested in making a donation, You can do so by heading again to our website and clicking on the Give tab. Again, thanks for joining us, and may God richly bless you.